Hi, good evening, everyone. I am Shandi Rose. On behalf of Across and Beyond the Arabian Sea, our storytelling forum, it is indeed my pleasure to welcome each one of you to our eighth session of storytelling, personal storytelling. It's so nice to say the eighth session. You know, it's been eight beautiful months on this story journey. Today, I would like to thank each one of you who's been a part of this journey, who owned this space for personal stories. Listening and telling, telling and listening that continues here. So today, I would like to thank all these wonderful storytellers who are coming and sharing their real life stories at our forum. It takes a lot to share personal experience stories because it is like, you know, sharing a part of yourself with others. So a big thank you to all the amazing storytellers. And I would also like to thank our listeners because listening starts first and that energy makes telling impactful and effective. So a big thank you, gratitude to all the wonderful listeners and audience. When I started on this journey, this forum eight months ago, I had no solid plan on how to get storytellers for each session, or I was not even sure that whether listeners uh, will be joining in for this sessions or not. The only thing that drove me throughout, which still is my sheer love for stories. That's the only thing that drove me throughout. And today when I see so many of you here joining us online, it's, it's always kind of a validation for that, for that craziness for stories. So thank you so much. On that note, let's start this beautiful evening of stories. As always, we have a theme for today's session and the theme is the gift or gifts. Our five wonderful storytellers are going to share personal stories of those gifts that's most special to them. Now the format of session is we have five stories and after all five stories get over, we have a discussion session of 15 minutes where the listeners, the audience, are most welcome to share their thoughts about the stories and any feedback about this session because your feedback is what keeps us going. With that, without any further ado, let's start our session. Did I mention today's session is extremely special to me? Yes, it is. So let me introduce our first storyteller. She is Geeta Ramanujam, who's joining us from Bangalore. Many of you may know her as master storyteller, trainer, and an author. She's also my guru in storytelling. She wears many hats, and she is the founder, executive director of Katalea, Trust of Stories, established in 1998. She also founded the International Academy of Storytelling, uh, the only globally recognized academy for storytelling that has certified courses affiliated to institutions around the world. She has over 40 years of experience as a curriculum designer for institutions across the world. She has traveled over 43 countries and 27 states of India to spread storytelling as an educational tool. She has recently launched her latest book, Stories from uh, Tales from Across the World. I don't have a physical copy with me, but my copy is waiting for me in Kerala. Those who are interested can get the copy. We will be posting the link in the chat box for getting that book. Today, Geeta Bam is going to share a personal story titled Searching and Seeking a Storyteller's Path. Friends, help me welcome Geeta Ma'am with a round of applause. Over to you, Geeta Ma'am. Uh, Ma'am, you are muted. You need yeah. to. Yes. Okay. Thank you for that clap. Thank you for that very, very, very warm welcome. 
uh, feel so wanted when you know that people are there to listen, right? And uh, thank you, Shanti Rose, for this beautiful session that you're conducting month after month. I'm so glad to be a part of the eight month session. I'm sure uh, I will cherish this for a long time to come. I also thank my fellow storytellers and most of all, the listeners, because without listeners, the storyteller just doesn't exist. So though it is online, I'm happy that I can see about 40 participants, very good to listen. Though her words are simple and few, listen, listen, she's calling to you. Meet the birds, tuppence a bag, tuppence, tuppence, tuppence a bag. Few songs remain in your heart. Few songs get etched. And this was one song when I was young. I was watching this film in a theater, along with my father. And this was a bird woman. And the bird woman was calling people to the chapel saying, come feed the little birds, show them you care. You will be glad if you do. The young ones are hungry, their nests are so bare. All it takes is tuppence from you. The value of feeding, of giving, of sharing. My father didn't say anything more. He just exposed us to this beautiful film. He also exposed me to a lot of beautiful classics. And then there was hardly any words that he spoke, which nudged me to do or to, to rebel. It just made me want him to speak something more all the time. His expressions, his silence, his adaptability is what a child emotes, isn't it? And I was the oldest in my family. So I, I just watched my father. He was my role model. And I, I watched him speak English. And that's how I learned the language. He read aloud stories to me in English. And that's how I learned. He never stressed on anything. He never told me morals. He never said, you know what? He never used such aggressive language. And yet he was firm. There were things that he wouldn't do. And that's it. So I learned a lot from my father in my growing up years. From a very average middle-class family, he had to work two shifts and yet he found time to take us out on weekends. He loved traveling and so did my mother who came from Tanjore and it was a little uh, town in uh, South India. And she was, first of all, she landed in Bombay that might have been her first travel. But very adaptable, again, the oldest in her family, just like my father was the oldest in his family. So you see both of them. My mother, she was very fond of Tamil and Carnatic music. And so she was very insistent that I learned Tamil. And the best way to learn Tamil is when you speak the language. Because in the school, I had English, Hindi, Marathi as my second and third languages. So who's going to teach me Tamil? And so through stories. And through proverbs, she would tell me. She would tell a proverb in the morning before I went to school and I would be, what is this? And the ye madri irkade, okay? Don't forget the name like that, ye. And I was wondering why this housefly forgot his name. When I came back in the evening, it's good mood. 
she would say, Korokora Kandre, Kandri in Thai, Thai in Wadaya, Wada in Kail Kole, Kole Chitum Kodi, Kodivalam Kulame Kula, Tilipum, Koke, Koko Pudicum, Mine, Mean Pudicum, Valaya, Valay in Kail Chatti, Chatti Pudicum, Koyavan, Koyavan, the room, Mane, Manme Valarum, Pule, Pule Tingu Kudare, and Pere, and this was the story. It was an associated tale of how a housefly forgot his name, went from the calf to the cow, to the stick, to the pond, to the crane, to the fish, to the net, and to the fisherman, and the potter, and the pot, and the mud, and the grass, and finally, <laughs> the horse comes. And he says, I remember my name. So that is how I can recall. This was in my second standard. I still remember she was wearing a yellow sari with an embroidered border because she used to embroider her saris herself. So that is the power of stories that left me. But you know, in those days, nobody said I'm a storyteller. They didn't. It just happened. And they took me to discourses. In discourses, I didn't understand what is ego, what is anger, envy, who knows all this. But we were all children playing, and the loudspeakers would be on. And I used to listen to Chinyananda's lectures. And I remember I used to come home and emote. And I used to say, ego and ego's endric desires. <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> so by imitating also, you remember, isn't it? When you imitate somebody. And I became the entertainer for my family because my mother and my pair, my father realized I could emote. So when we used to go to films, Asha Parekh, but the means the hika, idiot the hika. And this was Asha Parekh. Chucky pissing and pissing. Mousy suicide cancer. This was Dharmendra. Right? So, uh, even they used to take me to Malayalam films, though I didn't understand much of Malayalam then. My father, my parents exposed me to law. Panamaram, Panamaram, Bulicha, Panamaratia, Pudicho. It was one dialogue I remembered <laughs> from an old Malayalam film. So, when you're young, you're able to grasp. And then they took me to a lot of English films like Dr. Doolittle and then cartoons. E, what's up, Doc? I think, I think I saw another putty cat. <laughs> so this was Tweety Bird, you know. So I became the entertainment for my family get together every time during the weekends and holidays. And that's how I grew up, happy girl. Not that our, uh, our parents didn't have fights. Of course they had, and I used to put my slippers and go out and become an entertainment for all my friends. <laughs> I used to go down the building and I would just entertain. So I grew up and my father, I think I remember only one word, which he said, respond and don't react any time. So I didn't understand it much. And he also tell, told me anything that happens, ask what next. I had seen him handling crisis. So I grew up and I got married into a huge family. So it was difficult to adjust. But I remember what he said. He said, respond and don't react. Ask what next. So after I got my baby, I graduated. And then I just wanted to be a housewife. But then necessity, I got a teacher's job. And as soon as I became a teacher, the first thing I had to do was uh, all the children were crying. All the time, you know, holding the mother and saying, I want to go with the mother. And so I said, once upon a time, and still that boy was crying and his name was Rahul. I said, once upon a time, there was a boy whose name was Rahul and suddenly he stopped crying because you're involving him right and he always had a yellow color lollipop okay so it was on the white shirt it was dripping and it was terrible but I didn't want to do anything so I said Rahul loved lollipops 
And he said, yellow color lollipop. I said, yeah, yellow color lollipop. And I was think, saying, uh, Gita, think, 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 think. You have to go on with the story now. Okay. And you know, when one child cries, all other children cry. So everyone was crying. There was a symphony going on over there. So I, when I stopped and when he said yellow color lollipop, all the children came close. And I knew he had a sister. So I said, and she, and he had a sister and her name was, because I didn't know her name. And I said, her name is Sheila. I said, yeah, her name was Sheila. And both of them love to go for uh, their best friends. Uh, happy birthday. Because children love that, right? And he said, my best friend is Gopal. I said, yeah. So they wanted to go to Gopal's happy birthday. And so I built the story of the mother taking both the children down the road. And they are asking for more and more lollipops. And then they stopped crying. And all the kids came together. And then slowly held my hand and came to the class. Now, the best part of this whole thing was I had to tell the same story every day. So I didn't have to think of any other story. <laughs> so there started, I think, a little bit of my storytelling journey. This was way back in 1980-82. And so from that school, I went to another school and finally joined the Krishnamurti Foundation School, where I was the class teacher and I also became the show social science teacher, which was history, geography, etc. 100 acres of land, beautiful environment, Krishnamurti's philosophy was integrated learning and so I said yes I'm going to use every part of this beautiful campus because you know my father uh, he never accumulated any money because every holiday I told you they love traveling so he and my mother also love traveling so every holiday one LTC and he would take us to Kashmir they used to just travel and travel and travel. So travel was part of my life too. So I loved going out and there was this big lake and there uh, I had to tell them a story uh, about a lesson about amphibians. So I said, once upon a time, there was a fish and then there was a, 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 a frog and a turtle. All of them listened. And at that time, there were the village children who were also passing that, that, that whole way. And they used to also listen to that story. So it was not only the elite children, but also the children who were the village children who used to listen. In fact, they listened even better because they asked me questions. Now, you know, people with very conservative mindsets, they don't like to... Uh, they don't like this uh, method of teaching, right? Uh, when I taught, told them about uh, evolution of man, all the children would climb up the trees and listen like monkeys. <laughs> I didn't mind it because they were listening. Okay, but the others didn't like it. So they said, let's remove her from the school. Now it was decided that I was to go away from the school. But you see, my director was quite a visionary and uh, he also saw that any time I was free during the periods, I would come into the library and read a lot. Another habit that my father inculcated. So he said, let's make it a librarian. And so I became the librarian of that school. And all of them were happy because they thought I'll keep my mouth shut. Well, it's not so easy, isn't it? So... I read a lot and that's when I started writing for the newspapers. I uh, had the honor of uh, uh, interviewing Dalai Lama and great stalwarts and I started writing for the newspapers. But at the same time, the children were not reading. And so I said, and he walked inside that wood and he walked and he walked and he walked. And as he walked, it was a still dark night. Tang, the bell would go. And they would say, what happened next? If you read from page 40, you'll get the rest of Wuthering Heights. And that was how they started to go for books. 
And then there was a person who was overhearing this and said in 1996, hey, this is a wonderful idea. Why don't we have a workshop in the city? I said, okay. She said, let's call it creative writing. Mm, no, let's call it story talk. No, no, let's call it storytelling. Because those days it was not even heard. It was a new word. And so that's how in 1996 in summer, I had my first storytelling workshop. Now again, it's all about destiny. First five days, I had legends and epics. And the last day, I reserved for fables because I thought children would be restless. They would want to go back. And so, once upon a time, I said, there was a lion. The lion was caught in a net. Yes. Help! And the mouse. You, oh, hell. If you shout so much, I can't help you. You shout too much. Mm. Not the sound. The lion moved back. Now the mouse hit the net. Mm. You told me you won't eat me. Yeah, we are friends. And so I ended the story. And the next day, there was a newspaper column. Meow, sounds coming from a room. Do you want to know who this is? It's a storyteller in action. If you want to contact her, this is her number. Because the regional manager of Times of India had sent his son for my first workshop. And so the stars changed that day. There was a lady passing from Madurai who had five schools. She saw this small newspaper. She saw the number. She called me up and she said, Geeta, you're coming to Madurai to train 300 teachers from my five schools in the art of storytelling. And I said, I don't know anything about training. And she said, oh, you can, you will. So that was how uh, my entire life changed and 360 degrees. And that's how I became a storyteller. Well, there's a lot of things that started after that because sustaining an organization is not easy. I made it into a Kathalaya Trust, but we started with 1,500 rupees. Three teachers, we invested 500 rupees each and that's how we started Katalia. Well, it was a risk, but I think there was something deep inside me. And I again thank my parents for that. My father always said, you should be willing, you should be wanting, and you should be wishing. And never take a step back. So that's how I started storytelling. And I always end my story with a little story. So once upon a time, there was a cat and she had three little kittens. And these kittens were suckling. And the cat was relaxed. And at the door, there was a street dog, mouth watering. The cat was cool. She turned and she did. Boom! And the dog ran away. And the three little kittens looked up at the mother. And the mother said, it's always good to know a second language. So I have always asked people to use storytelling as a second language. Thank you so much to all the listeners. Thank you so much, Gita, ma'am, for, uh, for, uh, for that. It is, um, you, are, you 
packaged everything while uh, narrating the personal story because I heard many stories of yours, uh, but this is the first time your personal journey you were sharing and uh, in that you encapsulated so many other things, uh, some key aspects of storytelling, I would say, uh, with voice, with um, enacting characters and everything that a storyteller need to possess. You showed us that. Thank you so much for that, ma'am. Thank you so much. Now we would uh, discuss it further during the discussion session. Thank you so much. Friends, moving on. <clears throat> Our next storyteller for today is Akshay Gandhi, who is joining us from Bangalore. Akshay is a theatre artist and practitioner. His work has been performed at prestigious venues, including Stanford. Um, may I request everyone to uh, mute your audio, please? His work has been performed at prestigious venues, including Stanford University, UCLA, Spoken Fest, Mumbai International Storytelling Festival, to name a few. He has received his theater training at SIGA Company New York, Alden Theater Laboratory, Denmark, Indian Ensemble, Bangalore. He's the founder and artistic director of Still Space Theater, Bangalore. He has shared his thoughts at platforms like TEDx, Economics Time Summit, IATC Conference, to name a few. Today, he is sharing a story titled That Train Journey. Friends, help me welcome Akshay with a round of applause. Over to you, Akshay. Thank you so much, Shanti, for inviting and uh, and Geeta, ma'am, for really, really setting an amazing environment. Even though it's virtual and Zoom, you can feel your energy. And you spoke about language and you spoke about storytelling language. It's so amazing that you said it because I'm going to tell a story in English today, which is not what I usually do. Uh, I'm excited and nervous to be here. Nervous, one, because it's a personal story. I usually fictionalize my story so much that nobody in the audience recognizes what part of it is personal except me. And second, because I usually always, I've never in fact performed a formal show in English. This is going to be the first time I'm going to attempt that. So I'm <laughs> a little nervous about that. Uh, because as a performer, as a storyteller, Performing in Hindi feels like I have an additional limb, almost like a creative limb, one of the creative limb. It helps me jump, helps me play, feel free to perform. It's, it's almost like an extension. And so what happens when you lose one of your limb? And that is what I started thinking when Shanti approached me for this evening. And I said, okay, I'm going to try to, to tell a story in English, that too personal one. And then this thought about limb, became an important one. I started, uh, I started thinking that I went to English medium school and, and even then my English is like uh, all over the place because the kind of schools I went to, even English teachers used to teach us concepts in Hindi. And, and there will be a sprinkle of English in between somewhere. Uh, so after I finished my schooling, I went to Kota to prepare for exams to join engineering college. And uh, I was coming from a village, like a small town. And here I am in this institute, this big, massive institute. Everyone in this institute is speaking English. All teachers teach in all subjects in English. And I'm like, ah, I couldn't make sense of anything. I went to all classes, but I understood nothing. And as days went by, I started feeling left behind. I felt discouraged. I felt lost. And one day, like every other day, I, I was walking towards my institute. Hundreds of students, like this is quota, there are hundreds of students around me were rushing to grab the first few rows of the class. Because if you sit front, you, you really uh, make sense of a lot of things, I think. Uh, I was never in a hurry. Uh, they were very fast, all of them, and their eyes were focusing inwards. Their feet knew every step to help them reach where they wanted to. And me, I was figuring it out, step by step. At one place on the right side of the road, I saw a baby pig, a uh, piglet, uh, pinkish, soft, moving very, very slowly. As I crossed the piglet, I turned my head to see why is this piglet so slow and disoriented like me. 
he was severely bruised his front right leg was completely amputated matlab kharab ho jata hai na pura ekdam kharab ho gaya tha he was dragging his entire body barely to take a couple of steps i stopped disrupting the entire flow of the road something sank in me i could identify myself with him him uh, this piglet uh, i i have almost i have also lost a limb my language limb i was also bruised emotionally mentally uh, like in every other way not physically somehow i could feel his pain noticing him allowed me to notice myself notice things which were always there but always in blind sight that day throughout my classes i kept digging deeper and deeper into myself into why i have become what i have become a dull person lacking any life any spirit low on on energy and and having no no excitement i was never like that before what has happened to me after i came here to kota i used to be a person we say in hindi uh, befikra no jo befikre mein jeeta hai mane the mane one who lives every moment of life without worry without any tension so what happened to this befikra and my mind traveled to that train journey when i was 6 or or 7 years old with my mother i was returning from my nani's house after a summer break our train stopped at a station few passengers stepped stepped out few stepped in i don't remember the name of the station but as the train started leaving a boy 9 or 10 years old jumped into our compartment off white shirt bell bottom pants he was lean but strong slightly dark and had big eyes he was traveling alone without a ticket and yet there was no worry on his face no wrinkles on his forehead he sat at the window seat right across me right opposite to me he had a beautiful smile on his face and a very carefree attitude in his body that befikri he had that befikri we looked at each other i was thinking how can a boy travel alone on his own as his smile widened my lips followed and without me knowing i was smiling too we know we are friends now <laughs> you know when you're a child how easy it is to make new friends we ate a joint paratha with uh, aloo ki sabzi uh, we played with toys i was carrying we spoke about everything i mean everything which kids have in their life i don't remember his name but i remember his life was very different from mine and i was fascinated by him he took me closer to the door of the train you know wo jo darwaza hota hai train ka chalti hui train mein taught me how to stand there without being scared besides the door of that running train my body started absorbing that befikri which this person had in abundance and we stood there for what might be an hour or so until the next station arrived i remember the name of the station charles gaon he stepped down looked at me with a smile we both said fir milenge and with his befikri and madmast chal he walked away i can't see his face now the memory is blurred but my body remembers the befikri and since then i started living with more fullness with whatever i had rather than living with emptiness of what i didn't have my classes for that day came to an end with all this memory in my head images of the piglet kept flashing in front of me carrying all this chaos i stepped outside of my institute to walk towards my room it was evening the last few rays of sun continue to find place for themselves to form some poetic painting for anyone who has time to look at them as my feet were approaching that spot on the road side recording it oops as my feet were approaching that that spot on that road side my eyes were hoping to see the piglet at the same time i was scared that i might end up seeing a lifeless body i followed the light and what i what do i see i see that piglet has learned to walk and run with his three legs he was playing with other piglets making sounds cuddling touching catching each other like a befikra i stood there 
looking at him, looking at myself through him, smiling and smiling <laughs> and tickling and laughing. <sighs> I was happy. I was so relieved. That moment, that moment has given me back this gift which I first received as a child in that time, in the time I needed most. Today, sharing this story is like saying thank you to my friend on the train and to the piglet I once met on the roadside. Thank you. Thank you so much, Akshay. The gift of Befikre, you know, that's what I am taking from your story. I think that's the gift all of us need the most. <laughs> and the way you narrated, it was straight from your heart and we could feel, and I don't agree with you when you say you are English or whatever about the language. You And also, I was just thinking, uh, you described that dull person <laughs> earlier. And now when, when we see, however, I felt that you radiate a certain energy, uh, even uh, in this box of Zoom, and which is very, very positive and inspiring. Thank you so much for that wonderful story, Akshay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Shanti. Moving on, my dear friends. Our next storyteller for today is Ms. Mrs. Ridwani. And I will save her introduction for her story to get over. Uh, that's what she requested me. So we will hear her story first, and then I will introduce her. Her story is titled Finding Julie. Give her a big round of applause. Over to you, Mrs. Ridwani. Thank you. And I'll be sharing today story finding Julie. Hmm. And here goes my story. 2015, after 19 years of being married, Devina was looking for her old friend Julie. Julie was lying underneath layers and layers of memories buried in a dark corner. After pulling away the layers, Devina finds Julie. Julie looks surprised. Why are you looking for me after all these years? It's been 19 years since we last met. You never bothered to look for me before, she asks Devina. Now, before Devina responds to this, let's get some backstory to understand what's going on. I'm sure you all must be curious to know who Julie is and why Devina is looking for her. I too wonder what happened. Let's go back in time to see who Julie is. Hmm. Julie was a cute, bubbly, a romantic, so and a dating. She was the apple of her father's eye. And her father told her stories every night before putting her to sleep. <laughs> she loved her father. Although she was naive, she wanted to work, to, you know, be financially independent. She had this burning passion to build a name for herself. But her father was very conservative. He didn't allow her to explore or go out often. Just when she found courage, to say her father got her married at a very young age. In Hindu weddings, the bride and the groom, they go around this holy fire, it's called Feras. Every round that Julie took, she found herself fading away. She found her personality fading away. And that was the last we saw of her. Q, Devina, who now appeared in her place. 
with few years to settle into her new identity. You can tell Devina was a dedicated mother to her two daughters, an understanding wife, and a very loving and caring daughter and a daughter-in-law. That's Devina. Unfortunately, traditional Indian women are stereotype to keep their wants and desires on hold and to put their families first. And that's exactly what Devina did. Now let's fast forward it to 2015. Devina's daughters were now big enough to take care of themselves. Devina had some free time to meet her friends for lunch or a coffee without constantly worrying about her kids. She also wanted to express her love by giving those gifts to her loved ones. At that point of time, her husband was paying huge amounts for their daughter's higher education. Devina realized that she needs to be financially independent so that she could live a little without being burdened on her husband, as well as contribute to the family. Many creative ideas started popping in her head. Each one was more exciting than the last one. She was confused which to choose, but she was nervous to commit. She wondered, how is she going to manage her household chores, her responsibilities, and do a full-time job? Will her family even support her? <laughs> Devina's strong suit lied in underestimating her capabilities, and that's what she did. Fortunately, her daughter had introduced her to this life-changing philosophy in 2012, and she was following it. And this time, she prayed to identify how she can, you know, create value in society and be financially independent too. On a beautiful evening in March 2016, the sky looked lovely in colors of red, pink, yellow. Birds were chirping and returning back to the nest. Devina was walking along the seaside, inhaling the smell of the salty air, soaking in the last rays of sunlight. When she saw these homeless children on the promenade, sitting on the ground, and three women teaching them basics of English and math. Seeing these homeless children, Devina's eyes lit up. And now she knew what she wanted to do. She wanted to teach little children. And then what? She enrolled for ECCE teacher's course. It was a big step. Her life-changing philosophy gave her strength. And she felt that potential in her. But her friends doubted her decision. Even her mom asked her, do you think you can manage with all your responsibilities? All of this felt very overwhelming. That is why Devina was looking for that spark, that burning resolve. She was looking for Julie, Julie's determination and that fighting spirit she knew would take her forward. And she knew when she would bring forth Julie and Devina together, nothing could stop her. She did exactly that. And her course started. The first, month, the first month flew by. She was settling in her course. Suddenly, she was diagnosed with acute bronchitis. Her health worsened and she was hospitalized. During her stay in the hospital, she constantly questioned her decision. She thought, 
why did I jump into such a challenge, challenging task? When at this point of time, I had got this free time to relax after all these years. She thought it's not her cup of tea. She was thinking of giving up on it. A day prior to her discharge, while she was reading a book or watching television, everything was telling her not to give up. Like the universe was telling her not to give up. It was telling her not to let Julie lose again, not to let her disappear. And this time, Julie is fighting spirit one and she didn't give up. She continued with her course. Each lesson plan took her three, four, five, six, seven attempts to get it right. At times, it was embarrassing. It was frustrating. It was overwhelming, but she didn't give up. Just a month later, Devina's mother-in-law collapsed. She was hospitalized. She underwent angioplasty and was on ventilator support. If the life had been hard, now it was impossible to cope up for her. But her life-changing philosophy gave her strength and positivity to manage everything calmly and efficiently. She even prayed for her mother-in-law while taking care of her in the hospital. Thankfully, after 14 days of long battle of life and death, her mother-in-law came back home. <sighs> Devina was happy and of course was going on. Days, weeks, months, Finally, Devina was in her last leg of the course. She worked day and night to give her submissions on time. She prepared for her exam and guess what? She passed with flying colors. She even got a job in a prestigious international school as a teacher, but she didn't want to work there. During her course, she had discovered that she wanted to incorporate humanistic education in her lesson plans. And she wanted to do it in a creative way. That's why she enrolled for a storytelling workshop. And while, you know, going for that course, she realized that is what she wanted. That was her calling. She wanted to be called as a value creating storyteller who could enable children to tap the inner potential with her magical act of storytelling. Storytelling further helped her to keep her inner child alive, her Julie, while helping young children to heal, to be happy. This was the reincarnation of Devina. This new Devina came up taking the best world of both individuals, Devina and Julie. And my dear friends, I'm happy to share with you all. Here is your new Devina, a passionate storyteller. Thank you. Thank you so much, Devina, for that wonderful, wonderful story. Finding Julie, journey from Julie to Devina, Devina to Julie, and the combination of Julie and Devina. Loved the exuberance, energy, and enthusiasm you had throughout while narrating the, the, the story, your personal experiences. Thank you so much, Devina. And, and thank you, Shanti, for giving me this opportunity. And this is our know, honor and pleasure. Yeah, I know that your mom is there. I'm sure she is so, so proud listening to you. Thank you. So Devina, let me introduce her in two lines. She is a mother, ECC certified teacher, passionate storyteller and founder of Soul Enriching Stories. She has performed in plays 
by Secret Passages, and she has participated in Chennai and Jagan storytelling festivals. She works with children to enhance their emotional intelligence and communication skills. That's Devina for you. <clears throat> Moving on, our next storyteller for today is Vijayanti Pakala. Let me introduce her. Vijayanti is a verbal ability, verbal logic, personality development expert, certified train the trainer in soft skills and personality development from HSBC with a career span of 20 years. She has her own training center, Abhyasam, and has traveled across Europe and Australia conducting workshops. She works closely with blind schools and is a founder and mentor of four public speaking clubs for children. Today, she's going to share a story titled Corner of Happiness. Friends, Help me welcome Vijayanti with a round of applause. Over to you, Vijayanti. Thank you, Shanti. Good evening, everyone. With all the stalwarts here, and I take my first step into storytelling. This story is very, very close to my heart. This is a story that started in 1997, if I have to mention the year back then. A young bride with dreams in her eyes and getting married to the person that she would have always wanted to marry, a naval officer. What more can I ask for? And my dream destination from Vishakapatnam, I am traveling all the way to Mumbai, the then the software capital. Ah, I thought my life was set. Nothing to do more. What more can I ask? I have one sunny day all in form of my husband and my dream job is awaiting in Seeps, Mumbai. Ah, that's life. It comes knocking when you're least expecting it. I was turned down, not in one, two, any company I go. I said, excellent, you have the right qualification. Unfortunately, we can't give you a job because I have a tag called as the Navy wife because we move every three years. <clears throat> no longer Switzerland with Sunny Diol. I am back to my Mumbai Kurla house, not knowing what to do with my life. So I called my mom and I said, Mama, my life is over. Why it should always be me? I gave up so many things and again me, why? Why should I suffer? That's when she said, see, Vijama, I always follow what Audrey Hepburn once said. Your life is in your hands because it's what you're looking is for happiness. The day you find your happiness, you will find contentment. What more it's in your hands? So she told her story. It's about a young lady back in the 70s when she eloped and got married to the love of her life. And three years down the lane, she headed for a divorce. It was an unknown concept in the 70s. It's a big taboo, imagine. She had two young children, infant and a toddler. And she's a sole breadwinner. So with great difficulty after dabbling in many jobs, she found a permanent job in one huge prestigious public sector unit. There is life wherein you see being a divorced lady, a mother and taking care of kids was always a challenge. She was circumvented for promotions, everybody making fun of her, never finding a place or recognition for her. In all this, when she used to come home in the evening to see her children, she always had a beautiful smile. She never carried her troubles home. She was always smiling and laughing and sharing, doing all the housework. So after a period of time, she became one of the key pillars in that organization, wherein even the chief executor sometimes used to come and knock on her door to take some advice from her. That was what she was. She said, how do you think she achieved all this? Because in everything she did, 
she found happiness. Search for that happiness, Vijama. It is within you. It's not that someone has to give you that. That is in your hands. Don't be disappointed in everything you do. Search for that corner of happiness and you will find it. Ah, there I was next day inspired. You know, this bunch of resumes. I walk into Steve's and any company says there's an interview. Hey, come on. Yeah, take it. Look at my resume. And as usual, no job, but very happy. But that didn't stop me. I landed up in marketing, which is not my forte. From marketing, I moved into HR. And from all the way to Mumbai with a toddler, I land up in Port Blair, wherein there is nothing in the 90s. Now also hardly. The day starts and the day ends with you praying, oh, today there's rainfall. Wow, we have sunlight. Thank God there are no creepy crawlies in the house. So that reminded me what my mom said. Okay, there's no job. There's nothing to do. Should I sit and wallow in? No. There I picked up my third PG, an MBA. I was already an MC and an MSc with no job in sight. Now I have a third post-graduation. And all the way we moved back after four years to Vishakapatna. And the story is the same. My hometown, yet no job in sight. And me always saying, what should I do? What should I do? There comes knocking called training. And they said, why, Jinti, why don't you train children? I said, me? Children? I have never done it. They said, try it. There's no harm in trying it. Okay. So here I go to my first class was for the cat training. And I was supposed to teach them grammar. Nouns, pronouns. I was thinking, what will I teach almost graduates? Grammar? That to noun and pronounce? Believe me, when I went there, I realized there is a lot to teach. That was then. Comes 2005. I have my second child. And again, with a lot of frequent transfers and movements, it's quite common being a Navy wife, as I said. This lady who was my inspiration was diagnosed with cancer. The doctor looks up to her and says, you are an educated lady. How could for two years you did not go and meet a doctor? How do we tell that chap? We have been to doctors, but nobody diagnosed. So finally, after eight hours of surgery, he comes out and says, she has six months to live. There she was sitting in front of him. He said, are you sure six months to live? And he said, yes, six months to live. She came out and said, wow, I have six months to live. Can you beat it? I can live for six months. Imagine if someone had been given a death sentence and you know you're going to live for a limited period, what is the first thing we do? We cry. And here she was happy. And then she comes out and after chemos and radiations and many sufferings, she never let go of her smile. I've never seen her without a smile, always smiling. There were times when the doctors used to send terminally ill patients to her so she can counsel them. And she successfully survived for four long years after that. And till to date, she's my inspiration. She's none other than my mother. I've seen her many years in two saris, in a pair of saris. That's what she survived for many years. To a cupboard full of clothes. Always the same smile. Never I have saw her lost her smile. So 10 years down the lane, when I started training, my first one in 2012, there was a blind student who had come and said, ma'am, nobody are willing to train me for CAT. What should I do? I looked up and said, CAT? That to a blind student where someone wants to go for a common exam as prestigious as CAT with not taking up any special reservation is quite challenging. Yes. When he did it with 99.7 percentile, 
I said, yes, that is where my calling comes. So I knock on the door and through Rotary Club, I could get into two blind schools and I could train them. With children grown up and settled, I am very happy, contented because I am there. And yesterday was also my testing period because I met my husband after three years in Qatar, in Doha. I was so excited, packed my bags and I land up in the airport to know that I have to undergo a seven day quarantine in a small one room hotel. What should I do? Cry? No, that's when I remembered her. Smile, this too will pass. As she rightly said, in anything you do, find your corner of happiness. And yes, that's what I learned from her. I find my own happiness and I'm sure you all can do it. Thank you, Shanti. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Vaidendi, for that beautiful story uh, of smile. Corner of happiness. We could all understand the corner of happiness is within. It's not outside. We need not have to look for anyone. I love that smile that was so luminous on your face which I could say that the same smile of your moms, which is your inspiration. And thank you for sharing this story, this inspirational story with us today. It was, it was, you know, full of exuberance. It was not at all sad. It was highly inspiring, highly energetic. Like I said, that smile, that's what is sparkling throughout in your story. Thank you. Moving on, my dear friends. Our next storyteller for today is Mrs. Malini Saini. She is uh, originally based out of Doha, but right now she's joining us from Kerala. Mrs. Malini Saini is a passionate English teacher for her in high school and colleges for over four decades. She evinced a keen interest in reading, writing, gardening, traveling, and interacting with people. A postgraduate in English and social and abnormal psychology, she has had decades of association with Toastmasters starting from Dubai. She was the first lady Toastmaster to win the best speaker in the international speech contest, the first lady distinguished Toastmaster and the first to start gavel clubs, clubs in Dubai, Abu Dhabi and Kuwait. Today, she's going to share with us a story titled Gifts, a Change in the Concept. Friends, Help me welcome Malini Saini with a round of applause. Over to you. Namaskar, friends. <clears throat> my, my story is going to be in two parts. It's going to be a small little story and then a larger story. All connecting to the different concept of the word gift. When we were little, when we were little children, I remember the word gift would brighten up our space, make us smile, eagerly look forward to something exciting. Something exciting. My parents had a habit, you know, the night before my birthday, I knew they would silently slip something either under the pillow or on my bedside table. And I would wait for them, but they were cleverer. They never used to come till I really, really had fallen asleep. Come morning, I rub my eyes and say, wow, today's my birthday. And I fish under the pillow by the bedside. There's a beautifully packed gift. Open it, anything from books, to maybe a music video from a toy when I was a little girl or even a little doll. We never had Barbie dolls or something so ex exotic. I remember the best doll we had was the one which would open its eyes and close it when we moved it up and down. But even that gave us so much of joy, you know. And the other day I went to a party, a child's birthday party. And I was sitting and watching the children. People came and gave gifts. And this little boy was in a hurry, you know, to, he was just about eight or nine years old, opening the gifts. And I could see the expression, 
ah, this is not this, this is not that. And I was shocked. I said, what is wrong with children? What are they looking for? The brand, the price? For us, it didn't matter even if it was something worth 10 rupees. A gift was a gift. But how times had changed. Little ones know what are good branded stuff and what is not really worth it. It made me sad, you know. It really made me sad. And it brought back a memory when I was teaching in St. Vincent's in Asenso. It was Teacher's Day. And you know, Teacher's Day is the most exciting day in the school. Children are excited. The teachers are all dressed up and excited. And while I moved, I had passed the junior school before going to the higher secondary. So that day we were so busy, I passed by without saying hello to a little chubby friend of mine in kindergarten. He would wait for me every day outside the class and I would wish him. But somehow that day I missed him and I went to my boys who were waiting for me. Soon after some time, I find the office boy comes, ma'am, Mrs. Kilroy wants you to come to her class. Please, it's urgent. So I told one of the teachers, just look after my boys, entertain them, and I'll be back. When I went there, I found this chubby little angel standing by, behind the door with a grumpy face. So I said, what happened, beta? Me angry. I said, why? You not come? I said, oh God, big sin, so sorry. And the teacher told me he had bought a rose for me. And keeping that rose in his hand for so many hours was so difficult. And I'll tell you what happened. I said, give me my rose. He took it out from behind him, gave it to me. And there were two small petals on that rose. The rest had all fallen off. He looked at me wondering whether I would like it. I took it, I smelt it, and I said, it's beautiful. You brought it for me? Yes, but all gone. I said, no, this is there. And believe me, friends, till today, I have those two petals with that stem stamped inside one of my books. Because I felt that was one of the most precious gifts I had got. It made me so happy. Coming on to the broader side of gifts, when we look around and I find people grumbling, I say, there's so much we have to be happy. Look at the gifts around you. I try to tell the children, a gift is a gift. It's not the brand nor the price which matters. But it is becoming very difficult. And I suppose we parents are also partly responsible for getting them into that habit. Let me tell you about, of course, I've got so many gifts in life. The latest one is a beautiful painting, uh, uh, an oil crayon painting done by one of my other students I have taught 25 years back. He made sure that every teacher who taught him in that particular class got a portrait made for them. And I have it in my sitting room. What mattered to me was the pain he had taken. And believe me, every crease, I have a small little dimple which comes when I smile to the left. I didn't know it till I saw the portrait. So you can imagine how acutely they kept looking at us while we were teaching them in class. And believe me, I still feel that that career is something I would take up. I would not give it up for anything. It has given me so much of joy. The gift of joy which I received from those little children. Little children in schools and colleges also. But they were still like little children. God's biggest gift to me came in the year 1978, when my first child was born. When I took up the baby in my arms, you know, I realized what motherhood was. We were preparing for motherhood, reading books on it, but nothing like experiencing it in person. 
And I took the baby in my arms and I looked up to God and said, thank you so much. I felt my life was complete. Years passed and I still remember when he was a little toddler, about three, three and a half years old, or was it four years old? Yes, four, he was in nursery. I had guests at home, I was laying the table, when this little one comes like a tornado, almost knocking me over. So I gave him a shout and said, can't you behave yourself? I saw him going into his room. Then I got busy with the guests. And after everybody had gone and I cleared up, I went back into the room. He was fast asleep. I covered him up. On, the, on his bedside table, in a little bottle, he had put a few flowers. You know, they were wild flowers which he had gathered from the field. Nothing very exotic. And near that flowers was his, of course, jam bottle which became a flowers, was a small little card. I took it up. Somebody had told him it was Mother's Day. They didn't know what Mother's Day was. He had drawn something on the card and written, Happy Mother's Day. A lot of wrong spellings, but it was the cutest thing I've ever seen. I had tears in my eyes. That poor little fellow was coming all the way to give me that, and I had scolded him. So I said, I decided I was going to sleep with him. I changed, I got into bed. Morning before I could get up, he was up and suddenly planted a kiss on me, my cheek. Mama, you sleep with me? I said, yes. Why? I said, because I love you. And then I looked up, the, I, I took up that card and I said, it's so beautiful, you like it? A child's gift, so innocent, but so profound. It was full of love. And then last year, I saw my son through schools, colleges, settled him down in life. When his mortal remains were given to me on a picture, I cried, but there was a nun who was with me. She caught my hand and said, Malini, he was a gift given to you by the Almighty. So the Almighty has a right to take him back when the time comes. I stopped weeping, I kissed that picture, and as we immersed his mortal remains in the water, I thanked God. I said, thank you, God, for the gift you gave me for 42 years. And I said, farewell, my son. I wish you were born to me again next year. That was one of the most beautiful gifts which I had to return as it was given to me by the Almighty. So my friends always spread the word, appreciate gifts, love them, do whatever you want, but never ignore even the smallest gift which is given to you. Because a gift is something which is given to you, an object given to you with love. Over to you, Shanti. Thank you so much, Malini ma'am, for that uh, wonderful, wonderful, heartwarming story. You spoke about meaningful gifts that make us smile, that make us joyous, sometimes that make us less sad, hopeful, to find peace, gifts have a lot of meanings and you narrated it the best way, Malnidhi, that's what I call you generally. So uh, thank you so much for sharing this personal story with us uh, to remind us of the value, real value of gifts that is from the heart. Thank you so much. My dear listeners, what an evening we had with five beautiful, beautiful stories from these eloquent storytellers 
right from Geeta ma'am, Akshay, Devina, Vijayendi to Malini ma'am. It was amazing, different stories, different perspectives, but we could, the, as a listener, I could relate with each one of you. I loved each and every one story. And once again, I thank each one of you for choosing my forum, our forum, to share this story. And uh, thank you so much. Deep gratitude. Uh, now the forum, the floor is open uh, for our dear listeners to share their thoughts uh, about the stories. Please raise your hand, say your name, and uh, share your comments. Yes, Sunny, sir. Sunny, sir, you are muted. Yes. Thank you, Shanti. I had to run away from my place at 5.30 because the storytelling, I knew that starts at uh, 6 o'clock, came running for that. Thank you very much and uh, I had a good time. Some of the wonderful speakers I could hear today. Gita, the first speaker, Gita. Value of giving. We can never value of that particular giving if you see the enjoyment on the face of those who receive it. And the way you spoke Tamil, the Chen Tamil, and you said you had English, Hindi, and Marathi, first language, second language, third language. I was wondering if you had Tamil as a third language or second language. Extremely, extremely good language. You know, I like that uh, Tamil language and the fluency of the Tamil language. And what I like the best in you was the voice modulation. Amazing, amazing. You could reproduce the sound of every animal, everything. I tell you, amazing voice modulation. And uh, the phrase I learned from your speech was, respond and don't, don't react. There's a very subtle difference only between this word, respond and react. I like that word. I like the phrase, respond and don't react. Good job, Gita. And the second is Akshay Gandhi. Can I just uh, thank you uh, for such a sensitive observation, Mr. Varghese. Uh, it's always great for a storyteller to know that a listener has absorbed so much from a teller because it's not easy to keep up that sustenance of listening. So thank you so much for that wonderful compliment. Thank you. And the second speaker, Akshay Gandhi, that train journey. When you say about that train journey, I remember about that train journey, which I had, which I'm sure none of you ever had in your life. That probably I will tell one of these days as my story. You know, your childhood days that you came from a non-English medium school, came to English medium school. In fact, many of us, especially elderly people like us, had the same experience. We were not lucky enough to study in some of the best English medium schools like Malini or somebody like that, you know. So many of us had learned English or in those days, you know, English, English was taught in that regional language or, and they explained the meaning in those language. And many of us had gone through that, but those people found it very easy to learn English language when they were exposed to the English later. And uh, the compassion to a, an injured piglet, that shows exactly the character of that proven character in you, feeling empathy and compassion for an injured pigling. And you are a, a motivational speaker. Your own stories, that too, empathy, and narrated in your own ways. Very good language. I like your speech. I could understand, I can see through your character through from your speech. Good job, Akshay. Thank you. And third is uh, Rijwani, Friday, Julie. Wow. 
And what I liked was on the layers of memories. I like that phrase. I want, I have, I, I'm glad that I could add one more phrase into my dictionary, layers of memories. And the Devina, Devina is a story of many of us. When we look at ourselves or our relatives, it becomes a part of our story. And I like the transition from Julie to Devina and Devina to Julie. Good job, Madam Rijwani. Vaijayanthi Pakala, another great speaker. Corner of happiness. Wow. Why you suffer with all these privileges? I wonder why you are suffering with all these privileges. You had a, a naval officer as your husband, extremely highly qualified person. There was no reason for you to worry at all. And these sufferings that when we had, you know, when we were looking for jobs, these are all very common things, just natural. Imagine the people with the absolutely 5% of your qualification looking for a job. And imagine what would be the frustration they would have had. Imagine having a naval officer as husband itself is enough to, enough to enjoy life. Leave alone other things in life. And uh, still, found, you know, still found happiness in everything you did. Good. And happiness is a choice. I always say that is my phrase that happiness is a choice. You don't have to be a highly qualified person to be a highly experienced person, highly paid job to enjoy happiness. It's a choice, how we, how we react to each one of, each part of our life. I like that positive perspective. And that is how a person should be. Smile, find the corner of happiness. Not only the corner, the whole of happiness you can find. Leave it on the corner. And good job, uh, Vajayanti. We enjoyed it. And the next speaker is Malini Sani. Gift a change. Actually, storytelling is a child's play for Malini. Malini is like Idukum Mele. In a much, much higher level she is. Because she is one of our very close family friends. Malini and Raji were very close to us. And in fact, we know many of her stories, life experiences, and I don't have to say anything about her language, her style, and she's absolutely fantastic. Good job, Malini. I'm so glad that you could come and attend this meeting from the hospital. I hope you are doing very well. Thank you very much, Shanti. This is my observation. There is more to say. If I keep on saying, the time will cross 8 o'clock and you will kick me out after this. Thank you very much, Shanti. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sunny, Sunny sir, for, the, for that comprehensive, uh, you know, feedback or the, the thoughts that you shared for each story. You actually made notes. I could see that and you were describing. Thank you so much. Actually, people like uh, Sunny, sir, like, you know, who are attending these sessions and giving this kind of feedback is what keeps this uh, going. Thank you so much, sir. Pratibha raised hand. Uh, next, Pratibha, can you please unmute? Hello, good evening, everyone. Good evening. And uh, first off, I would like to uh, give my gratitude to Shanti for this amazing platform. You know, it's like one hour of, um, uh, like, like one hour you take, uh, you took a like, journey through different emotions, different stories, and you don't realize how one hour passes when we attend your sessions. So thank you so much, Shanti. And each story was like one story, well, like, you know, each was one better than the other. You, you, one emotion, like it began with a highly energetic story and then it went on to a lot, lot of life lessons. So uh, a big uh, hats off to all our storytellers. Each one of you are amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pradiva. Thank you. Uh, while moving to the next person, uh, let me request uh, Geeta, ma'am. You are her new book. I said the new book is launched. Whoever is interested can check that book out. If you have the link, ma'am, can you please post it in the chat box? The uh, you are muted, ma'am. Shanti, I sent it to you on WhatsApp because okay. I'm so bad with technology. All right, uh, I will, I will, I will <laughs> take that. I will take that at book. I will do that yeah. right away. So here, here is the book, um, and I, I think uh, uh, you would all love it because each one, just like how Shanti is doing these episodes, each one has 
uh, uh, preview to the to the story from where I got it. Uh, I had written five pages of preview for each story, and it all got cut down to one paragraph, but very succinct. So you know exactly from where I got that story and how I found that story. So there's one before and after of the story that is just a little fact and little bit of learning and little bit of discovery for each story. So people will know something about the place, about the teller, about its culture, everything in that story. So that's that's how this, this book has come out. And I'm sure uh, most of the stories is, uh, are, are something that I, I really personally felt very close to my heart, uh, picked up from mountaintops to lakes to, to forests, uh, stayed in the forest for three months. And that's where I picked up one of the tales and uh, from a symphony orchestra that I attended. So I've had a lot of experiences of my own life and I hope to bring that out also as another book uh, soon, which might be launched very soon because um, I didn't want to make it bragging or boring, but uh, I just make it like, uh, you know, uh, another story, but a real and real life. Like, that's what I wanted to do. So that this book uh, has been much appreciated. Thank you for, to all those who have been reading it. So please get a copy of the book. It's not too expensive. Uh, I think it's two ninety nine on uh, Amazon.in. So if you just go to Amazon.in and put Tales from the World, you will, uh, I'm sure, procure the book. And uh, Next. I'd be very happy if you'll also keep in touch. That'll be lovely. And have can you show me the uh, book again? Excuse me. Yeah, can you? You want to put a gallery view? I can show it. Okay. Yes, I can. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Geeta, yes. ma'am. And I'm yeah. going to Thank post you. the link in the chat box so that people yes. who are and it, and it has uh, yeah, lovely, yes. lovely. Oh, lovely. so nice. Very yeah. nice. <laughs> ah, I'm <Musha>. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Sarot sister. Sarot sister. Oh, hi. <laughs> yeah. So sweet. Sweet. Very Sweetheart. nice session. Very yeah. nice session. Really. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sri Karuna raised hand. Can you please unmute Sri Karuna? Uh, I 